This is a very big story that's taking place in Lebanon. And my mother told me about this years ago, right? And she said, just, just wait and see. Um, uh, you know, this um, gas that they have in Lebanon, what the Israelis are going to do. And she was right. <laughs> She's always right. So um, let me show you what's going on. This is a headline from France 24. It says, the arrival of Israeli gas installation reignites Lebanon maritime border dispute. So just to break this down very simply, the Israelis are sending an enormous ship, a really gigantic, ginormous behemoth to take Lebanon's gas. Here is the ship and here's the company, actually. It's called Energian. And they're proudly boasting on Twitter. This is posted on June 6th. They're showing off their, this enormous thing there in the back. Do you see that? It's being towed. Absolutely enormous. This thing. My goodness. Wow. And, and they're boasting about it, right? They said, um, uh, the only FPSO in the East Mediterranean has, trans has transited the Suez Canal and arrived on station. So um, just so you know, FPSO is floating production and offloading. Okay, so it's basically they take the, the, the oil um, and uh, then separate it. And, uh, you know, they have uh, um, basically um, it's, it's offshore uh, oil and gas processing. You know, it, it's an all in one, to put it simply. Um, and this company is saying that they will bring both energy security from the natural gas that, it, that they will produce and competition to the region. <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it, competition to the region, more like, more like conflict to the region. You know, L Lebanon says this is our section of our, of our sea, of our maritime area. Um, and then the Israelis say, no, it's ours. And for years, no one really talked about this. No one really, there's nothing. But now the Israelis have just sent a ship, right? They're like, go, let's go ahead and take the gas, right? It's not discussions. No, 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 just take the gas. They say here, an Israeli floating gas production unit arrived in the maritime zone disputed between Israel and Lebanon on Sunday, prompting the anger of the Lebanese government, especially as negotiations between the two countries on this dispute are at a standstill. So like I told you, they haven't talked about this since a decade, right? But the Lebanese president warned the Israeli government against any aggressive actions in the maritime area. Floating production storage and offloading unit belongs to the company Energian. So I just showed it to you here, right, on this tweet. And um, it's listed in both Tel Aviv and London. Israel and Lebanon have never drawn their borders. The Karish gas field where Israel is exploring uh, is located in a disputed area of 860 uh, square kilometers in the middle of the eastern Mediterranean where huge gas reserves have been found in recent years. Let me explain this to you very simply. Uh, when you say Lebanon and Israel have not drawn their, drawn their borders... Uh, Lebanon is not going to sit down with a bully, an occupier, and an aggressor and give them uh, any sort of validation. I told you most Arab and Muslim countries do not recognize Israel because it is not a country. It is a, a European settler colonial project. It was started in Vienna by um, Herzl inventing Zionism, the British then 1917 Balfour Declaration. Why should, why should Lebanon sit down with a country it does not recognize and draw borders? This is a, it, they are occupiers, but you shouldn't give them one centimeter. On the contrary, we should be liberating Palestine, right? This is the mentality. So here's the map, uh, just so you get an idea of, of the area. There's Syria, Lebanon. This is in red, the area where the Israelis want to steal the gas. They want to take the gas. And don't forget, of course, that Israel is illegally occupying Syria's Golan Heights since 1967. And the Golan Heights give the Israelis one third of their fresh water. Right. So they take that from Syria. And of course, there's oil. Right. A lot of oil, a billion barrels worth of oil in the Golan Heights. And I remember this headline from 2013 where you know, the Israelis want to give a drilling license to the Americans, to a Dick Cheney linked company as if it's theirs to give away. So, you know, totally unsurprising that they're uh, trying to take Lebanon's gas after what they've done to uh, Syria's Golan Heights. The Lebanese president, Michel Aoun. And outgoing Prime Minister Mikati said any exploration, drilling, or extraction work Israel carries out in the disputed areas would constitute a provocation and act of aggression. Then France 24 said the Israeli government, they see the Karish gas field as part of its exclusive economic zone, and they think it's not disputed. Yeah, well, again, the Israelis st steal everything. Israel is literally built at the expense of Palestinians.
oh, no, this is a firing zone, right, with Mesa Ferrieta. This is a firing zone. You can't live here. And then they kicked them out, right? Oh, this imaginary uh, uh, kangaroo court that's set up in occupied Jerusalem. Oh, this is not your house. You have to leave, and we're going to give it to some American uh, Jewish settler from Brooklyn. You know, they, they, they take the Golan Heights from Syria and say, oh, well, this is Israel. Of course it's Israel. Oh, you know, uh, not just um, uh, uh, the Golan Heights, but all of Jerusalem. This is our capital. And then they illegally annex the Golan Heights. They illegally annex uh, Jerusalem in 1980, 1981 with the Jerusalem law. No one recognizes this. The, you know, even the UN is like, th this is not legal. According to uh, Lori Haiteyan, who's a Lebanese expert in geopolitics of hydrocarbons, and uh, heads the Middle East um, program at this uh, government institute in New York. He says that with the arrival of this platform, everything will go very quickly for the Israelis. The production and sale of gas will be able to start in three or four months since contracts have already been signed with Israeli companies. So you know what the issue is also? It's not just about tensions with Lebanon. It's right now with this war in Ukraine, uh, the prices of oil and gas have gone up. Okay, So they're also trying to relate it to that. They say that uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has left Europe scrambling for cheaper gas, right? Remember, um, most of Europe, so the European Union has banned Russian coal. Uh, they've banned 90% of Russian oil. The reason they can't do it completely is because, you know, Hungary and so on objected. And we, when it comes to Russian gas, you know, Russia said you have to pay us in rubles, our currency. We're not getting, you know... Uh, we're not going to take money that is in euros and dollars and also on top of it in your banks where you can just steal it, sanction us again. So only a few countries have abided by that. And there are countries like Poland that completely, you know, they just stop paying for the gas because they know that they have a pipeline with Lithuania. They have a pipeline coming. Um, uh, they're buying <laughs> gas in reverse from Germany on the Yamal pipeline. And they have all these other things which they can use to replace. You know, they have an LNG terminal. So hypothetically, they can replace the Russian gas. Other countries, you know, not so... Um, it's not looking that sure. Uh, you know, Finland, for example, they've also been cut off Russian gas. Although, again, that, that phrasing kind of... It implies that Russia maliciously, like purposely turned off the gas to Finland to mess with them. No, Finland just stopped paying. So, yeah, why should Russia give gas for free? Countries like Austria, they need, they need the Russian gas. So it's very... that When it comes to that, when it comes to gas, it's a different picture. But the European mentality has been like, we need to go find alternatives. We need to buy LNG, liquefied natural gas from Qatar, from the United States. You know, anything, anything but Russian gas. So basically, let's pay four five times more for gas just because we are idiots. And want to, you know, bend over backwards for the Americans. But well done. So while Lebanon has been aware that the gas project was on the horizon since last year, uh, the problem has been its fractious ruling class that lacks a unified position on the maritime border issue, meaning talks have been unable to proceed. So resolving this dispute is crucial for Lebanon, mired in an intractable uh, economic crisis since 2019, that's putting it mildly, to be able to carry out its own exploration for hydrocarbons in this disputed area where Block 9 of Lebanon's exclusive economic zone is located. So this is found just off the shore of southern Lebanon, and um, it's uh, very rich in natural gas. So they say that Israeli-Lebanese talks aimed at solving this started in 2020 under the aegis of the UN and the US, so, so via those two. Uh, the mediator and US diplomat uh, Frederick Hoff, who's Washington's point man on this issue from 2010 to 2012, he divided the area into two parts. The Hoff line, so that's named after him, attributed 55% of the area to Lebanon and 45% to Israel. The Lebanese side has not accepted this demarcation. Once again, I look at it this way, and I think any reasonable person should look at it this way. This is like the partition plan. You know, they, when, they, when the UN carved up Palestine, they're like, oh, let's give, you know, half, it's not really half, approximately, uh, you know, half to the Palestinians and half to the European settlers. And, and actually, they gave more to the Israelis, right? Even though they were much, much less, they were t their population was much uh, smaller than the Palestinians. And the idea is, why should Palestine give 1% of its land? Would the United States accept giving a, a, an inch of its land to foreign settlers? So always like, yeah, you know, the Arabs have to compromise because some Europeans said so. I'm sorry, man, come on. Uh... <laughs> They say, they say dialogue restarted at the um, UN inter ah, UNIFIL. This is where my parents work. 
in October 2020 after the two countries agreed on a framework for talks. But two months later, they reached an impasse again because the Lebanese delegation claimed an extra 860 kilometers in the south. Uh, Beirut has nevertheless not made this claim official at the UN because while Michel Aoun, who's the president, uh, initially supported his country's bid for the additional maritime territory, he feared it could end negotiations with Israel, whose government said in October 2021 it was ready to resolve its dispute with Lebanon while refusing to let Beirut dict dictate the terms of the talks. The head of Hezbollah is uh, Nasrallah, okay? Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah. And he's, he's very popular, actually, in the Arab world. I know they want to tell you something else on TV in the West, but um, when, you know, when Nasrallah gives a speech, <laughs> every household is gathered at the TV. I don't just mean in Lebanon. This guy, Bin Ghalib, tweeted that um, Nasrallah said the Greek company must withdraw its ship from the Lebanese Karish field. So again, this is the, the disputed um, the, the area where Israel is coming to take the gas. Um, he, so Nasrallah said, the Greek company must withdraw its ship quickly and immediately, and it must bear um, and its management and owners full responsibility from now on what may befall this ship materially and humanly. ووقف هذا النشاط الذي سيبدأ ويمكن أن يكون قد بدأ يجب على الشركة اليونانية أن تعلم على أصحابها وإدارتها أن يعلموا أنهم شركاء في الاعتداء على لبنان الذي يحصل الآن وهذا له تبعات وأن عليها أن تسحب السفينة سريعا وفورا وأن لا تتورط في هذا العدوان على لبنان وفي هذا الاستفزاز للبنان المقاومة اللي هي هيك والمقاومة المقتدرة أيضا مش ضعيفة لا تستطيع أن تقف مكتوفة العيد We don't want to hear any nonsense about oh the, the ship didn't really cross the line <laughs> The Israelis like to play this game you know when there were flotillas um, people launching humanitarian missions to help Gaza they would put supplies, food, you know, all sorts of things to help the Palestinians because they're literally under siege. They would go with the flotilla in the Mediterranean towards Gaza. And while they're in international waters, they, so they're not even in, you know, Palestinian waters or the occupation's claimed waters. They're in international waters, like, you know, really, really far off. The Israelis came and boarded the ship like pirates, you know, took them to Israeli prisons and treated them like, like terrorists, you know, for daring to bring food. While, while they were still in international waters, they went and grabbed them, which is a crime, which is a violation of maritime uh, rules and, and uh, illegal. You, you, you cannot just, you know, go and arrest someone in international waters and claim that they, they came into your uh, maritime zone. This is ridiculous. These are not empty threats. I told you earlier, when I was in Damascus in 2006, when the war was happening right next door in Lebanon, and there was this constant fear, like, is it going to spill over? Because you, you don't know what's happening. Every single day is something new. Iranians, by this time, they had given Hezbollah lots of equipment, really, really state-of-the-art equipment. And Hezbollah themselves, they had trained and become very, um, you know, much more capable and advanced than they were in 2000 when they, when they kicked out the Israelis, remember? <laughs> so they also did that. And in 2006, they shocked the Israelis. Completely took them by surprise. You know, the Israelis don't like to admit it, but this was a, a, a complete victory for Hezbollah. You know, they, remember, this is a, a political party that also has a military wing. This military wing, it does not have a navy. They do not have a, an air force. And yet Hezbollah is more powerful than the official Lebanese army. And they took out an Israeli ship. They didn't sink it, but they, you know, they basically... Uh, made sure it was out of action. Ever since then, the Israelis have never gone back into Lebanon and never dared to launch an airstrike on Lebanon. They do violate Lebanese airspace often when they're on their way to bomb Syria, but they have never bombed Lebanon again because, Les because Hezbollah you know, taught, them a, taught them a lesson. It's kind of pathetic in a way that you know, Hezbollah is the one that has to do the Lebanese government's job. They're the ones that brought in uh, fuel, 
last year, you remember when Iran gave them the fuel for free? So this is something that a government should do normally. The, the Lebanese army is, it doesn't even come close to Hezbollah. And actually, this is a criticism that people say, oh, it's, it's a state within a state. No, <laughs> it's, a, it's a group that's defending its country and has proven that it can do that better than anyone else. And they're, they only attack it because they're, you know, power-hungry people. I'm not going to get into Lebanese politics right now. We've done this before. But I just want to say that it's kind of crazy that, you know, Nasrallah is the one that has to get on TV and threaten, uh, or should, should I say, not threaten, uh, but, uh, you know, defend Lebanon and its gas. You know, and the president, he has nowhere near this kind of uh, power. Because when Michel Aoun says something, okay, Yes, he's the president. <laughs> when Nasrallah says something, people, they actually, they actually listen. And not just in Lebanon, I'm telling you, man. This guy, when he speaks, everybody tunes in. So in, in Athens, in Greece, the foreign ministry, they summoned the Lebanese chargé d'affaires to Athens. And uh, apparently the Greek foreign ministry advised the Lebanese chargé d'affaires that the extraction ship in the Middle East is not owned by the Greek government. So they're talking about the big uh, behemoth that I showed you. <laughs> And um, the Lebanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs was informed of the presence of Greek sailors on board the ship that Tel Aviv brought to the Karish field. So the Lebanese Foreign Ministry was informed that the ship was owned by a private company and the government had nothing to do with it despite the presence of Greek sailors. Because Nasrallah, when he was speaking here, he said the Greek ship. And when we were looking at the article from France 24, they said that it's a, it's a company listed in Tel Aviv and London. I guess the, the Greek foreign ministry now are just saying that there are Greek sailors on board, on board this uh, ship, but uh, nothing more. It's not Greek owned. It's privately owned. I mean, this really doesn't change anything. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think Lebanon wants beef with anyone, uh, let alone Greece. So there's a Lebanese protest about the uh, ship. Hundreds of people and several lawmakers were protesting in southern Lebanon against Israel, moving this gas production vessel into the Karish field. Okay, so this is from Sharq al-Awsat. Days before the U.S. envoy who is mediating maritime border talks between the two neighbors is expected in Lebanon, and after the ship operated by, here we go, London listed Energien, which is the, the company here posting on Twitter, arrived in the Karish gas field last week. So several hundred people, you know, they're waving <laughs> see Lebanese and Palestinian flags. <laughs> This is the thing that, man, no matter what the issue is, just always the Arabs, they bring a Palestinian flag because that's it. That's how you do it. You have to, of course. Quote, we absolutely refuse to neglect Lebanon's maritime resources, which belong to all Lebanese, said Hamdan, who's a lawmaker and reading out a statement from 13 independent parliamentarians, most of whom were newly elected last month, right? As we saw, the prime minister, the president, they condemned Israel. Um... And this envoy, Hochstein. So before him, it was Hoff, and Hochstein is the envoy this time. So he's going to arrive on Monday. So that means he will be in Beirut on the 13th of June, according to the State Department. We'll see what this envoy does. I don't really expect much from that. I think you're, they're going to have a little, you know, a few days of chatting, and then that's it. And then it's going to, the talks are going to break down. And the Israelis, they might keep the ship there for a while or move it back or actually go ahead with it. Would they really, what do you guys think? Honestly, what do you guys think? Do you think the Israelis will go ahead and start extracting the gas if the talks break down or they, just because they feel like it? Even, even though Hezbollah threatened them. What do you think? 